You are listening to Proof Text, a Glossa House podcast by Dr. T. Michael W. Halcom, Dr. Frederick J. Long, Dr. Mario Melendez, Dr. Jennifer Noonan, and J. M. Smith. Welcome and enjoy. Hey, welcome back to Proof Text. My name is Dr. Mario, and this is a segment that we like to call What's in the Name? Um, Today's name that we're handling, uh, we've been walking through different books of the Bible that are named after characters. Today's name is Jonah. Jonah. This is one of the texts that we teach people or that I learned first or that we teach people first whenever we uh, teach them the language of Hebrew from the Bible uh, because the book is quite simple to read. But within his name, there's great irony um, and great wordplay that happens through the text and then parallels to the New Testament in a great way. So let's walk through the three points that we always cover. Etymology, irony, and an application. So let's talk about the etymology. Jonah's name, Yonah, means to uh, be a dove or it means dove in its actual basic root form. Yonah is a dove, like as in the bird. Two ways this is ironic to the name of the book and to the story of the book. One way is that Jonah is, well, like a dove. He's quite flighty, uh, as my Greek professor would say. You would, uh, strangely, or, or it'd be really crazy to walk up to a dove and the doves not take off if you were to encounter them in the park or in your backyard or somewhere like that. Jonah, likewise, as soon as Yahweh shows up, poof, he is gone. He takes off and he flees. Of course, he goes down to Tarshish. Um, and so he, he's, uh, he's wanting to leave and go away from Nineveh, where God was telling him to go to. So in that way, he's like a dove. He flies away as soon as Yahweh shows up and he flees from his presence. And there's that whole conversation of regardless of how far I go, I cannot flee from your presence. And then we have a second poignant fact <clears throat> in regards to his name and his story. And that is that, well, doves in the Old Testament, especially within Jewish theology, we could say, a dove is a symbol of, well, peace. Um, And and we really see this first show up back at the story of Noah and the flood, right? Uh, Noah uh, releases a dove and the dove comes back with a, a branch signifying that all is well, there's peace, there's dry land, you can now exit the ark. Um... And so why is it ironic, though, for Jonah's story? Well, it's because Jonah is supposed to be offering peace, um, we could say in Christian terms, the gospel to the Ninevites, um, but he's not initially. He doesn't want to offer the peace because he knows, in the words of Jonah, he knows that God is a God of second chances, a God that would relent, a God that would show peace to the city. For the city is great unto Yahweh. And so rather than him going and offering peace, like a dove should be a symbol of peace, he does the opposite. He he tries to flee from offering peace to Nineveh. And then likewise, whenever he does finally show up to Nineveh after the whole uh, Jonah and the fish epic, um, he walks around whispering the good news of the gospel. He doesn't proclaim peace boldly and loudly, but rather is like, repent for the kingdom of God is coming. Repent for this. You know, and it's not very serious. And yet they do uh, repent and adhere to the good news of the prophet. So what does this mean, number three, for our lives, for New Testament implications and things of that sort? Well, two ways. Let's consider the name Jonah for both Christ as well as for Christian in the New Testament. Um, With Jesus, the second epic where we see a dove really show up in the text that gives really good meaning to a story is at the baptism of Christ. Uh, Jesus is baptized, and as he comes out of the water, it says that then the Spirit of the Lord descended upon him like a dove. Um, And then, unlike the dove Jonah... Jesus willingly goes to share the good news. He willingly goes to do what the Father has asked of him. Though he does have that conversation with the Father in the garden, not my will, but yours be done. Please let this cup pass from me, right? 
Uh, I think I flip-flopped those, dyslexic mind. Um, so Jesus, unlike Jonah, actually does go through to the point of bringing peace about. And he doesn't run from what God called him to do. Uh, a, another way that uh, we have a parallel in the New Testament with Jonah is within the life of the Christian. Um, many of us as believers, and I would encourage you to read lots of great stories of uh, Christians of long ago. Uh, there's a great book called 52 Christians Every Christian Should Know. Um, there's other versions of that of differing numbers. Uh, read through some of these great Christians of the past, and you'll find that, like Jonah, sometimes many of us Christians are reluctant or even disobedient to the call that's upon our lives. Just like Jonah ran, um, he goes down to Joppa trying to go to Tarshish. Uh, we as believers, a lot of times will try to run from the calling of God on our lives. Uh, but God ultimately does turn our lives around back to his will. And so we see a reluctance, we see a disobedience, we see a fleeing from <clears throat> doing what God has called us to. We see a fleeing from responsibility. Um, this one really comes in to play in regard to Christians and the gospel, Jesus tells us in the Great Commission to go and make disciples, to share the good news throughout the whole world. And yet, how many people do we actually parallel Jonah? Um, because a lot of times, Christians, uh, we don't want to share the good news for many differing reasons. Maybe we don't want to share the good news with a certain person because we know they might accept the gospel. Maybe we don't want to share the good news because we're afraid and don't know how to do it, or we're afraid of our ability in sharing the good news that we might mess up or something of that sort. And so like Jonah, sadly, many of us do flee from our calling and our responsibility in that way. But two really good points that also parallel Jonah in the Christian's life. One, learning from mistakes, learning from mistakes. Um, we see Jonah learn um and, and realize that there is uh, mistakes that are had and done in the believer's life, but the Lord is merciful. And so we need to learn from our mistakes so that we might see mercy. And this is the beautiful conversation that Yahweh has with Jonah toward the end of, um, you got angry about this b uh, bush that came up overnight and gave you shade and etc. and now it's gone. Um, should I not show mercy toward the city as well, who there are thousands of souls within? Um, Jonah <clears throat> learns from his mistake. God still has to use a word picture for him to really get it, and that's in the shade tree. Uh, well, sadly, we also should learn from our mistakes and pay attention to word pictures that God might use in our lives so that we might not be like a dove and flee from what God has called us to, but rather be like a dove and be a bringer or a harbinger of peace. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the peacemakers, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let us not be like Jonah and run from our calling and our name of giving peace, but rather let us be like Christ and be a peace bringer rather than one who flees from it. This is the name Jonah for the week, and I hope you'll reread through the story and reconsider how we as Christians oftentimes are like Jonah in the reality that we have a message of peace, but oftentimes we don't want to share it for various different reasons. May the Lord touch you and work with you as you read this book and understand his name. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye now. Interested in growing your ancient language skills but not sure where to start? Glow's House can help. From illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars, Glow's House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glowsahouse.com today. Glow's House, language resources for the global community.